Okay, the final item of business this evening is a members' business debate on motion 12918 in the name of Fulton McGregor on tackling sibling sexual abuse in Scotland. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons. And I invite uh, Fulton McGregor to open the debate around seven minutes. Mr McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I firstly want to thank all those members who supported my motion. And I, do, I want to say that I do understand that matters like these are incredibly sensitive, and although it may be difficult for us here to debate it, it is extremely important that difficult issues such as these are indeed discussed in Parliament so that we can advocate for all those who have had these distressing experiences. Indeed, as a survivor told me last night at a round table I hosted here on the issue of mandatory reporting, speaking about it and raising awareness in the comfort of our Parliament is much less difficult than the experience of those, of those who were subject to such horrendous injustices against them. I want to therefore thank everyone who stayed to support the debate and those who have chosen to contribute. President Officer, in this speech, I will outline the characteristics and impact of sibling sexual abuse, explain the complexity of this issue and look at ways in which we can move forward in addressing it in Scotland today. The genesis of this debate came from a meeting that I hosted here in Holyrood as convener of the cross-party group on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse in January 23. At this meeting, survivors with lived experience of sibling sexual abuse, along with experts, candidly outlined the nature of this abuse with first-hand accounts, along with the latest research available. From this meeting, a subgroup was established, and in late 23, the group published their paper tag tackling sibling sexual abuse in Scotland. I would recommend this paper to any member who has not yet had the chance to read it. There are too many people to acknowledge when looking at the work that has gone into this subject, but I must thank the cross-party group Secretariat, Anne MacDonald, who has worked tirelessly to ensure those who need their voices listened to are heard, and she joins us in the gallery this evening. Likewise, I must thank Stuart Allardyce, Director of the Lucy Faithful Foundation, and someone whose extensive research skills have made this debate possible. I know Stuart could not be here in the gallery this evening, but he will be watching the debate on the broadcasting services. But most importantly, I would like to thank those survivors who contributed so powerfully to the discussion and bringing us to this point. And I pay particular tribute to Ailey Forgan and Ashley Scotland, who are in the chamber tonight. Many believe that when a child is abused, it is down to a stranger, but this is not the reality. Most child sexual abuse is committed by someone known to the child. Quite often, it is someone within the same household. And if this cohort studies suggest that at least twice as many children are sexually abused by a child sibling as by a parent. And while the most common form of sibling sexual abuse are occasions whereby an older brother abuses a younger sister, all combinations of sibling sexual abuse have been recorded, with younger abusing older, sister abusing brother, same sex abuse, and even abuse where multiple siblings are involved. There are occasions also where disability is a factor for the victim or for the sibling perpetrating the behaviours. Like other forms of sexual abuse, sibling sexual abuse can lead to multiple negative outcomes and health concerns, including PTSD, depression, substance misuse, eating disorders, relationship difficulties, and many other harmful impacts that can affect survivors long after the abuse takes place. Presiding officer, sibling sexual abuse is also unique and profound effects on the family unit too. Parents and carers are put into a position of addressing an awful situation within their own families. Shame, conflict, denial and disbelief are commonly reported responses that occur within families if cases of such abuse come to light. We heard that some parents described the situation as like a bomb going off in their family. Such was the impact. I emphasise the word if cases come to light. A sibling sexual abuse is thought to be a type of abuse that is seriously underreported. According to a study which interviewed 41 survivors of this type of abuse, it was noted that it was much less likely to be disclosed than any other forms of abuse, down to reasons such as fear of being punished, blamed or not being believed, because they were afraid of the sibling, not understanding that what was happening was abuse, not wanting their sibling to get into trouble or not wanting to upset their parents. And of course, another concern is what happens on those occasions when the abuse is reported. Responses are often unhelpful and can range from an uncertainty on what to do to attitudes like, that's just curiosity, exploration, play, and part of growing up, a doctors and nurses sort of attitude. 
And these responses are not just from adults close to the child, but also from agencies. And I know from my own time as a social worker in child protection how difficult and complex such situations are. And there are no easy answers, as much as we might want there to be. Yes, yeah. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Fulton McGregor for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. I have now signed the motion, and I'm glad he mentioned his um, expertise in social work. So I was keen to, to understand um, what additional training does the member believe would be important, and how could that be taken forward here in Scotland? Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the member for that intervention, and I am going to be coming to that. But I did want to move on. It's probably a good point to move on to, to say that if there are child protection procedures underway or any children need to be placed in care before or after sibling sexual abuse comes to the fore eh, and, and people are aware of it, this can lead to huge impact on decisions around whether children can be safely placed in care together or not and all the competing factors that come to those type of decisions. And I think that's important to mention because it's an, an issue that was um, explored thoroughly in today's earlier debate on keeping the promise, but there is, uh, there, when children sometimes aren't placed together, there is sometimes uh, other reasons in the background, and I would suggest that uh, sibling sexual abuse could possibly uh, be one of those, although I do agree with the premise of the debate earlier that we need to do a lot more to make sure that siblings can be placed together when possible. And that leads me to the important point that we must also rem remember when talking about sibling sexual abuse. We're often talking about two children, the one committing abuse also being a child themselves. They may have experienced abuse and trauma themselves, and due to the complex nature of these situations, there may also be occasions where various children eh, within the same household are victims and abusers. It can sometimes be easier for adults and agencies to get their heads around a situation if the abusing, si abusing sibling is an adult, which sometimes they are. However, that is not always the case. So it's no wonder then that our protection services are not always equipped to deal with such situations as they arise. There is no blame here. As an ex-social worker, I would say there's, there's no blame. The whole purpose of this debate is to raise awareness and try to find better solutions. Further to that, although there is a great body of research on the effects of sibling sexual abuse and the forums it can take, there is no unified consensus of any single explanation as to why it occurs. There are strong links with this type of abuse and family factors, such as marital discord, domestic violence, physical discipline and poor sexual boundaries. And given this clear link between sibling sexual abuse and family factors, I believe that in examining the issue we must consider it a problem of and for the family, not just a problem of the sibling who abuses. As I said, they can often be a child themselves who has indeed experienced trauma. Indeed, the cross-party group's paper asserts that traditional responses until now too, sibling sexual abuse can often involve Siling the issue and uh, treating the abuser in a vacuum without also providing ample support to the family unit who themselves could need the tools to make sense of the trauma. Presiding officer, I have talked at length on what the sibling sexual abuse is, what its impacts are and the importance of treating it as not just an individual's issue but as a whole family issue. But we must now focus on looking forward and opening a discussion on what steps can be taken to ensure its actions, not just words, that this parliament can be seen to support. From working with the cross-party group, a number of ways forward have been discussed. That I would be interested in hearing the Minister's thoughts on these in our summing up. The first is simply beta, better data collection. Although data exists from studies conducted across the UK as a whole, there are no Scotland-specific studies. Case reviews and indeed subsequent literature reviews would be invaluable in mapping the child protection pathways and how they operate in Scotland today. Secondly, a reference group which pulls together the expertise of bodies such as Social Work, Police Scotland, various charities and those with lived experience would be a clear way to establish a body that would be best placed to advise on policy while identifying best practice. Thirdly, awareness campaigns or even conference events would greatly promote signposting to key resources for families who are concerned about sibling sexual abuse, as well as keeping relevant bodies informed on the various gaps that we are currently seeing with service provision. Finally, I would underline the need for a dedicated course to be established for social workers and any other safeguarding professionals who may encounter cases of sibling sexual abuse. As I have stated already, this is an issue that is underdisclosed. We must ensure that those who are on the front line of this issue are properly trained to identify the signs of sibling sexual abuse and act accordingly. Tied to this concept of improved training would ultimately be further funding for a dedicated national service that would support not only survivors of sibling sexual abuse, 
for their families who are affected by it too. In conclusion, President Officer, this is an incredibly sensitive issue, and I again want to thank all those who signed my motion today to allow it to be discussed here. In order to combat this issue, we need the data collection to understand its prevalence, relevant bodies working together, identify best practice, and the awareness among society to identify it, and of course the funding to ensure the best support networks in place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McGregor. We move to the open debate. I call for Sharon Dowie to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Uh, in four minutes, please, Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Fulton McGregor for bringing this important topic to the Chamber and look forward to working with him and indeed all MSPs here today to make a positive impact. The issue of sibling sexual abuse is probably one of the most complex and sensitive to have been debated in the Chamber. In many ways, it is the ultimate taboo, a topic that people simply don't want to talk about. But we must talk about it. Otherwise, we are badly failing the victims of this abuse and families who are often left in ruins as a result. We have heard today about some of the devastating statistics in relation to this matter. And Mr McGregor is right to point out in his motion that in Scotland we have no robust mechanism for gathering data on this. Like every problem, without the statistical evidence, we cannot properly establish the extent of it or where it is most likely to occur. Various global studies are helpful in educating us about patterns and vulnerabilities. Many of these naturally relate to well-known problem indicators like deprivation, stability at home and wider sexual and domestic abuse. But without raw data of our own, we cannot know for sure all the details that we need. Setting up such a mechanism for gathering and recording this data for Scotland is an essential opening step on which I think we can all agree. Of course, that in itself does not tackle the problem, and it is clearly one that will be extremely challenging for a number of reasons. Even though sibling sexual abuse is the type of abuse most likely to happen within a family, it appears to be the one that people least want to talk about. Those with lived experience have spoken about the fact that, when it is reported, people just do not want to know. They either do not want to think that it is happening or simply cannot believe it. Worryingly, this is not just a reaction from the general public, but from support services. We also must take into account the difficulty victims have in raising this. Like so many kinds of sexual abuse, it is more complicated than simply picking up the phone to police. There are wider implications, sensitivities and confused feelings involved. A child being abused by a sibling will likely be scared of them and worried that no one will believe them. That abuse of sibling will have a power over them. Yes, yes. As a long, long ago secondary teacher, is there a role here? Because teachers often identify changes in behaviour of children in their classes. So is there a role here for primary and secondary teachers just simply to be aware that this might be one factor that they don't think about? They think of other kinds of abuse, but maybe not that. Sharon Dowie, give the time back. I thank the member for the intervention. So, so Philip McGregor at the end of his speech there had listed a lot of things we can do and I think it's something that we need to have a discussion about, about what other things we can do to maybe raise awareness, training and teachers. Train, teachers do get a lot of training to go and identify a lot of issues within children in their class so that they're aware of them, but I definitely think it's an idea that we need to go and look at and progress. The abusive sibling will have a power over them which is hard for most of us to understand. And what about when they bring it up to their most obvious source of confidence, their parents? They're often met by denial and disbelief, the shock of the situation being completely overwhelming for the family. Parents who are receiving devastating news, not what about one child, but about two. Experts have also pointed out to the long-term impact and how families can be wrecked and never recover from these instances and how victims, even when they have broken away from their family, are in fear for the rest of their lives about coming back into contact with their abuser at gatherings like weddings and funerals. That is on top of an increased likelihood of suffering from PTSD, depression and substance misuse. Presiding officer, we all agree this is a difficult and complex phenomenon. It is hard to talk about and hard to understand. But I hope, by MSPs discussing it today, we can make a start in tackling it and better supporting those families who have endured it. We must do so on a productive and cross-party basis. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms Dowie. I now call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Katie Clark around four minutes. Ms Whittam. Presiding officer, I must thank my colleague Fulton McGregor for once again bravely bringing to us a subject that is profoundly painful yet critically important to address, the trauma and family turmoil caused by sibling sexual abuse. And I also want to thank the cross-party group for their determined work on this subject and for the comprehensive paper highlighted in the motion. Sibling sexual abuse is a form of family-based trauma that often goes unspoken, as we've heard. The complexity and devastation it causes ripples through the affected family, leaving behind emotional scars that can and do last a lifetime. We know that sexual abuse by a sibling is often underreported and often misunderstood. When we think of sexual abuse, we may instinctively think of strangers or adults. But the reality is that sexual abuse can occur within the home and between siblings, and is estimated to be double the rate of abuse by adults. This is a topic that many survivors find difficult to speak about because of the deep feelings of shame, of guilt, and of confusion that often accompany these experiences. One of the most difficult aspects of sibling sexual abuse is the loss of trust that it represents. Families are meant to be the sanctuary where we feel safe, where we are protected. When abuse occurs between siblings, it shatters that sense of security. Every family member will be affected in some way. The child who is abused will feel violated, and the child who abuses may also be grappling with their own trauma, confusion, and hurt. And too often, these complexities remain hidden, leaving no room for healing and recovery. And we've heard that there's often other issues at play within that family itself. The trauma from sibling sexual abuse is not limited to the victim alone. Family members, parents, and even extended family members will experience confusion, anger, guilt, and isolation. And parents in particular are often left wondering how they could have missed the signs or prevented it from occurring, and will naturally feel torn between the responsibilities to both children. I think all of us can imagine just how horrific that would be. The emotional weight can be unbearable, leading to rifts within the families, misunderstanding and a breakdown of communication. And many families struggle with how to move forward and will become fractured. There are also profound emotional consequences for the survivors. And in Scotland, we know that mental health services are increasingly recognising the need for specialised support for those affected by sexual abuse. But these services are not universal, universally available and often they're stretched very thin. Survivors may experience depression, anxiety and PTSD. They may have difficulty forming healthy relationships later in life or struggle with issues related to their self-esteem or their self a sense of identity. They may even turn to substances in order to cope. And I have seen this in my own work in Women's Aid and Homelessness Services, working with survivors. And I know support must be all-encompassing. We can have no silos in this area. As the report states, there is so much we need to do in this area, including creating spaces where survivors feel safe to speak out and where they are believed and their experiences are not minimised and not trivialised. Silence surrounding sibling sexual abuse only perpetuates the trauma and allows it to continue. We need to break the stigma and raise awareness within our communities. And we must ensure that all children within the family have access to appropriate therapeutic support. Sibling sexual abuse, like all forms of sexual violence, requires a multifaceted response that includes not only child and family services, but mental health care, social support and family therapy. And education is key here. We must teach children from a young age about boundaries, about consent and healthy relationships. I used to do that work myself within schools, going in and speaking about what a healthy relationship is in the context of domestic abuse. We need to create an environment where young people can feel empowered to speak up if they're hurt, and where parents and guardians know the signs of abuse and are equipped to respond. But we also must ensure all of our safeguarding professionals, be they teachers, be they police, be they registered childminders, everybody that comes into contact with children who has those duties, are trained to respond to disclosures and have the support to do so. And there's also much we need to do in terms of research into sibling, sibling sexual abuse. We need to better understand its prevalence, its long-term effects, what kind of interventions are most effective. By conducting more research and gathering the data, we can better develop policies and resources for supporting both the victims and the families affected by this traumatic experience. We owe it to all of them. Thank you.
Thank you. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Audrey Nicholl around four minutes. Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's a pleasure to follow Eleanor Whittam and to hear about some of the first-hand experiences she had um, prior to becoming an MSP in her employment. And I congratulate Fulton McGregor on securing this debate. And I recognise the work that's been done by the cross-party group on adult survivors of child sexual abuse on the subject of tackling sibling sexual abuse in Scotland. I think it's important, as Sharon Dowie says, that this debate is happening in the Chamber today. Because, as Fulton McGregor said, there's a common misconception when it comes to child sexual abuse. And many people, I think, believe that it's a problem of stranger danger. So it's surprising for many to learn that most child sexual abuse is by people known to the child and very often family members. And as Fulton McGregor said, in fact, sibling sexual abuse is the most common form of family sexual abuse, given that it's estimated that at least twice as many children are sexually abused by a child's sibling, by a brother or sister, um, rather than by a parent. In 2021, the cross-party group started looking at this issue. They stated exploring whether the right supports were in place for adult survivors affected by this issue and looking at whether there was enough done in Scotland to identify and support families where sibling sexual abuse as an issue within our child protection processes was an area that they wanted to look at and prioritise. Members of the cross party group have continued to gather important evidence on the nature and scale of this issue and the paper that they have um, worked on lays out the work of the group on this subject to date and I think this chamber should commend them on the work that they have done. I very much hope that the work that has been done by the cross party group feeds in both to the debates in this chamber but also into the Scottish Government's thinking in this area. To discover that your child has been sexually abused by another child must be one of the most distressing experiences a parent can face and that perhaps is even more so the case when you learn that it's one of your other children. And for a sibling to be sexually abused by what is often, but not always, an older sibling or siblings who have a position of authority over them, the abuse that is experienced must be seen by many to be an ultimate betrayal of trust. And as Eleanor Whittam said, often will impact adversely on their mental and physical health over a lifetime. Sibling sexual abuse is less likely to be disclosed than other forms of sexual abuse, perhaps due to shame, fears of imprisonment, blame or whether they'll be believed, but also um, perhaps because they might be worried that they, the sibling um, might face um, punishment. Um, and often it may also be that the the person is afraid of the sibling. They do not understand what is happening as abuse. They do not want their sibling to get into trouble and don't want to upset parents or the wider family. So we must do more as a society to support survivors of sibling sexual abuse in a trauma-informed way. We need to learn more about it to understand how it is that we better address this issue. I believe there's many ways in which we can better support this group and there are of course many recommendations within the paper produced by the cross party group which I believe is a good start um, and also that the funding of a dedicated national service which can support children, adult survivors and family members affected by this issue which has been suggested in evidence based ways could be something that might significantly improve outcomes. I'm happy to support this motion. I'm very pleased that Fulton McGregor has brought this issue to the Chamber and I hope um, that it will lead to more work being done in this area to help ensure that the recommendations of this important report become a reality. Thank you, Ms Clark. And we now call the final speaker in the open debate, Audrey Nicholl, again around four minutes, please, Ms Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I also um, commend and congratulate Fulton McGregor uh, for bringing this debate and for uh, his commitment to this uh, complex uh, and difficult uh, and often hidden uh, issue. And I'd also like to commend the cross-party group uh, on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse 
on their broader work and for uh, putting this, uh, this report uh, together. So the motion, uh, as other members uh, have referenced, sets out a significant amount of de detail and it lays bare the extent to which sibling uh, sexual abuse is believed to be underreported in Scotland, the challenges survivors continue to face uh, with regard to their experience being uh, minimised, not believed, uh, and, and, that can be, uh, and that it can rather be seen in the context of uh, curiosity or ex uh, experimentation, as others have spoken about. And, and the paper that the cross-party group um, produced recognises and sets out the significant and lasting impact of sibling sexual abuse, uh, the shame, the fear of blame, not being believed. Uh, but in addition to that, some of the physical uh, impacts on survivors, including depression, substance abuse and, and relationship difficulties. And these can be really enduring uh, and last well into adulthood. I'm pleased the motion makes reference to the complexities of how to respond to sibling sexual abuse and it outlines, um, others, as others have spoken about, some of the ideas and views on how to respond and how to draw some further focus on this issue, uh, bringing stakeholders, good practice uh, and those with lived experience um, together. And I think it's worth noting that we're having this debate immediately following a debate on the promise uh, that the Minister led that seeks to create a care system that places love and relationships at the centre for every child and family who needs support. And I've got absolutely no doubt of the commitment across Scotland to giving children the best start in life. So in the short time left, I want to just reflect a little on my own experience of working in policing. Many members know uh, about my background, a bit about the progress made over the years around the investigation of sexual, uh, childhood sexual abuse more broadly, uh, and the new challenges that are emerging that are making tackling uh, this issue even more challenging. Now, many members, as I say, know of my background, and it's probably safe to say uh, a good part of my uh, service was immersed in complex public protection investigations around child sexual abuse, domestic abuse and latterly adult harm. Uh, and I also spent many years involved in the development of policy and practice in this space. And on that point, I think we have moved to a place in 2024 where there is a plethora of guidance, legislation, uh, organisations that aim to support the response to sexual harm, including that perpetrated uh, on siblings. And I think that is to be uh, commended and recognised. And I'm pleased there is some focused guidance within that uh, and material relevant to sibling uh, sexual abuse that I really hope underpins uh, the response, particularly at local level, when a disclosure uh, is made. And I think on the point that Monica Lennon made on training, that's absolutely at the centre of how robust and effective that response has to be. And I note the report published by the, uh, the cross-party group makes uh, reference to the need for better care pathways for survivors and joined up policies, and I completely agree with that. Now, in my experience, this is absolutely key, but it can take time uh, for organisations to come together, agree roles and responsibilities, information sharing protocols, uh, and so on. And earlier today in the uh, Criminal Justice Committee, we spoke about the challenges faced by individual organisations working within a whole system uh, such as justice. And that brings me on to my second point, if I may, um, that I would raise, which is about professional, trusted professional relationships absolutely underpinning uh, the work around tackling public protection uh, and um, closer to home here, um, sibling uh, sexual uh, ab ab abuse. Uh, I'm very conscious of, of the time, so I'm just going to finish on a couple of points, if I may, presiding officer. Um, moving forward to now, uh, members will be familiar with the Bairnshoos, 
which is a child-centred trauma-informed approach to enable children to give their best evidence um, where necessary, but in a single space that brings partners, police, health and recovery uh, services uh, together. Uh, and I think just finally, um, I would, uh, I suppose, raise some concerns around the escalation uh, on uh, the escalating incidence of online child sexual abuse, which I think is something that we need to be monitoring uh, and watching with, in, uh, with regard, specific regard to um, sibling sexual abuse. So again, I commend um, my colleague Fulton McGregor and the cross-party group. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now uh, call on uh, Natalie Don Innes um, to wind up the debate around seven minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. I want to start by thanking Fulton McGregor and the Cross Party Group for Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today and for their continued focus on this really important issue. Keeping children and young people safe from sexual abuse and exploitation is of paramount importance for the Scottish Government, as has been made clear in today's debate. Cases of sibling sexual abuse are often extremely complex and their impact can result in lifelong consequences for both victims and their families. Now, I acknowledge the calls that have been made today for further focus and action on sibling sexual abuse. The overall scale and complexity uh, of child sexual abuse and exploitation is increasing globally and demands a whole system approach to tackle this horrendous form of abuse. In response, we have established a new National Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation Strategic Group, which first meets on the 18th of November. The group brings together practitioners, service providers, the third sector, academics and other experts, including members of the CPG for Adult Survivors, to consider the range of current action and where further activity is needed. While it will be for the group to determine its priorities, I expect it will consider many of the issues that have been raised today, which are shared across all forms of sexual abuse and exploitation. This includes the challenges of improving data and training and developing evidence-based services for victims. Now, Fulton McGregor raised some important issues, namely um, specifically in relation to data, as I've, I've just mentioned. And indeed, I do feel that this, although I, I can't speak for them, I expect this will absolutely be considered by that new national strategic group. I also thank Elena Whittam for her contribution and for relaying her experience in that, her previous role. On the involvement of teachers, professionals who work with children and young people are absolutely essential to identifying harmful sexual behaviour. Our, harm, our, sorry, our Harmful Sexual Behaviour Delivery Group published guidance this spring to support professionals such as teachers to identify, to intervene and prevent harmful sexual behaviour in children and young young people, including sibling sexual abuse. Now, over and above the focus of the... Um, the of course. Full McGregor. I thank the uh, Minister for taking that intervention. I wonder if she agrees with the premise of the, um, the, the speech that I, that I made earlier, which was about that I actually do think there's been a lot of good work um, being done by our agencies in terms of identifying sexual abuse and sexual harm and I, and I take my hats off to the people out there in the front line um, working in that sphere but does she think that uh, I agree with me that there's there's specific um, issues relating to this particular type of abuse that's still uh, a major taboo and has, has got a range of difficulties surrounding it even when presented to professionals like social workers or teachers Minister I can give you the time back I absolutely agree, and I'll go on in a little uh, moment to reflect on the support for training for um, teachers and other professionals. But I think we're all in agreement here today that this is a very complex area, and I think we need to come together to, you know, think of solutions as to, or, or um, think of ways to improve um, that, that the situation. Sorry, I've just lost my place. Um, 
So through the implementation of national policies, including getting it right for every child, we put the experience and the rights of children at the heart of the work carried out by everyone who engages with young people and families. And that is embedded in our national guidance for child protection, which outlines the responsibilities and expectations of those who work with young people to protect them from all forms of harm. And this resource includes detailed professional guidance on how to respond to cases of sexual abuse between siblings and emphasises the need for a holistic approach to intervention and provision of support. We also published a Child Protection National Framework for Learning and Development this year, which supports multi-agency child protection learning and training. This clarifies where training is required to support local leads, and a national child protection hub has also been established to support practitioners sharing, to share learning and to share best practice. In response to the recommendations of the expert group on preventing sexual offending involving children and young people, the Scottish Government also established the Harmful Sexual Behaviour Delivery Group. Now, Monica Lennon asked about what further training is needed for our social work workforce, and I believe this was raised by other members too. And the group has developed and published guidance to support professionals to identify, intervene, and prevent children and young people from causing harm through their sexual behaviour. Professionals are being further supported through learning and development resources and a practitioner forum established by the Lucy Faithful Foundation and the Children and Young People's Centre for Justice. What happens to us all as children shapes who we are and can have a huge impact on us throughout our lives, especially if those experiences are adverse ones involving exploitation or abuse. And I am unwavering in my commitment to ensuring that all victims of sexual abuse can access the services that help them to disclose their abuse, whilst also recognising and responding to the impact of their experience. Now, Audrey Nicholl mentioned Bairns House, and this model supports children who have experienced trauma, including child sexual abuse, through a child-centred approach to delivering justice, care and recovery. This approach also promotes the Scottish Child Interview Model for joint investigative interviews. And this is now operational in all policing divisions and 30 local authorities and alongside Bairns House Developments, provides an approach that supports disclosure and minimises the risk of further re-traumatisation. As highlighted in this debate, victims of sibling sexual abuse and their families frequently require ongoing mental health support. Since 2021, we have provided local authorities with £15 million per annum to deliver community-based mental health and wellbeing support and services for 5- to 24-year-olds and their families. Now, I, I understand that. Um, I, sorry, I want to touch very briefly on mandatory reporting before I come to a finish. Now, I understand that mandatory reporting is one way to ensure that action is taken when someone discloses abuse. And I understand this is something that the cross party group on, and, on adult survivors has had a particular focus on. And I will continue to engage with the group on this very important issue. With that, presiding officer, I think I will draw my, um, my remarks to a close. But I would just once again like to say I really do appreciate and thankful to McGregor for bringing this to the chamber. I think it is important that we come together and recognise the difficulties and the complexities around this and talk about the ways that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. And I close this meeting of Parliament.